Across the Park podcast is proud to be sponsored by Globe Gas and Heating. For the best kitchen and bathroom renovations, boiler servicing and repair, and central and underfloor heating in the Northwest, head over to globecentralheating.com and quote Across the Park for a free quote. Hello everybody, welcome to Across the Park podcast, a very special edition of Across the Park podcast. Our big mate is back. I've had him on the podcast in the past and I'm going to give you, Super Kev, the same introduction that I gave you last time. This man walked into Everton Football Club in March 1999. There was a vacant Superman's cape. He put it on. The rest is history. One of my all-time favourites, Mr. Super Kevin Campbell. Kev, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Ian, thank you very much for the wonderful intro. And uh, I'm fine, thank you. I am fine. You know what? I'm a lot better now, Ian, now that Sean Dyche's in. And the team looked to be going in the right direction. But we're going to cover that. But I'm, I'm fine, mate. I'm good, thanks. Good, good. We are going to get there, Super Kev. You're right. Look, what I do want to do before we move on to, to this season is last time we had you on was last season. We done a derby preview. Um, at the end of last season, when you were watching <clears throat> Goodison Park and you were watching the supporters connect with the team, beating the likes of Chelsea, Manchester United, Newcastle, Crystal Palace in those atmospheres, did it take you back to 98-99? Of course it did. It took me back. Um, look, I know how, how much this, this football club means to the fan base. And, you know, Everton being in a little bit of problems, you could always rely on the 12th man. And the 12th man showed up. You know, the the uh, I was a little bit envious, I've got to say, Ian. <laughs> because, you know, the welcome the team got, you know, with the blue flares and people turning up early, you know, the, the fans realised that the team really needed them and, and they showed up and they played their part. And the scenes at the Palace game were, were you know, if, if ever there was a game to sum up Everton's season, it was the Palace game, wasn't it? First half, nothing could have gone worse. And then second half, Everton come to the table and, and, and score three goals. And it was an incredible comeback, win and stay up. And to see people on the pitch, etc., was was amazing. Yeah, that, that Palace game is something that, you know, for all the wrong reasons, really, will stay with me forever. Um, it, it was just the relief of, of being on that pitch. And I think what we'll try and get into the theme is, is when you were, were, were captaining our club and scoring goals to help our club. Like, Why are we back in, in this situation? So I think if you look at this season, Kev, and we've spoke to, to numerous people, we've spoke to, to supporters, we've spoke to ex-players, and, and everybody seems to have a different opinion as to what's gone wrong. That maybe says to me that there's a number of things. Do you think that there's a number of things that have all collectively happened to that Port Everton once again going into April in a relegation fight? I would say so, Ian, if I'm honest with you. Um, but for me, the biggest issue was selling Richarlison and not replacing him with goals. For me, that goals changed the team. If you stick with Charleston in this team, I don't think Everton are in problems because you score mm. goals. But you take him out and Dominic Calvert-Lewin, we, we know what the problems is. I don't even want to, you know, dwell on that. Problem, Everton haven't had anybody up the top end of the pitch who can consistently be there and score goals. And any team in the league who doesn't have that are going to struggle. So it's it's been difficult. Look, we, we know... There's been problems at board level. We know the fans haven't been happy. We know there's been problem at squad level. A, a, another changing of a manager where, you know, sad to see Frank Lampard go, but hey, listen, the record at the end wasn't great. Needed maybe a change of a, a different face and somebody who really can work with what they've got at the end of the day because, I mean, January transfer window was, was an embarrassment, wasn't it? And I think that got the backup of a lot of Evertonians, got my backup. And, uh, you know, I came out and spoke out about the, the team and the board, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day. It's crazy, but Ian, everybody needs each other. 
you know, the, the family is dysfunctional, but everybody needs each other because <laughs> as much as you, you go, fans are, are upset about the board, you still need the board to be in position to give the new manager support and, you know, didn't get it in the transfer winner, but he still needs to bring the new manager in to get the support, try and get the, the team on a better footing. And I think I think the team are on a, a decent footing right now. Yeah, I think where we are is, is a lot better position-wise than where we were, maybe. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but where we probably were under under Frank Lampard. I, I do feel there's an element of, of, of Frank was maybe... I wouldn't say the right man at the wrong time, I think, but I do think it was the wrong time. I think he came into a club and and he, and he maybe needed a, a lot more, a lot more structure around him and a lot more support. I know the fans gravitated to Frank, and I think Frank overly reached out, which I think maybe he had to do as 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 a as a guy coming with such a strong connection to a different club from the south of England, and he came out and reached, and, and the fans connected. I just think of it was the perfect storm of of a lot of things going around. I think you you spot on there in saying. The, the, the lack of goals in this team has arguably put us where we are in the league. We, mm-hmm. If you can't score goals, you can't win games. I also think there's a, an awful number. There's a lot of number of other things that have that have came to fruition. Fans' frustration now, and you've been at the club as a player when you've probably seen fans' frustration yeah. to other areas of the club. Felt I think it. it's, I've, it's, I've been there. I felt it. Yeah. Is, you know. Yeah. And I think it's at a boiling point now. I, I think it's reached a level that that maybe when when you weren't there. I think that didn't help the manager. Now, now what I'm trying to get to is there were scenes at, at Bournemouth in November. I'm sure you've seen them where the fans and the players were sort of... It was, it was like a division. At a standoff. Kind of at a standoff, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and, and yeah. everything Frank Lampard had done and everything the fan groups had done was to bring it together at that moment. And then we went into... Which, in hindsight, was a disastrous time to have a World Cup for Everton Football Club because it, it prolongs everybody sort of calm down. We go into the Christmas period. Wolves beat us. I think, I think after Christmas we get done by West Ham, Southampton, and I, I think an element of, of maybe a stronger structure and and a, and a better structure would have possibly seen change before when it happened. Do you think that's fair, or do you also think that it was maybe right to give Frank Lampard those four or five games after the World Cup break? Look, look I think. Um... Frank Lampard had the favour of the fans. I think you're right. I think the fan groups and the club were and the uh, and the manager had connected. I think there was a connection there. Um, I think the fans liked Frank Lampard for what he brought to to the club. But ultimately, it's it's what you do on the pitch, isn't it? It's results. Yeah. And Ian, losing games, uh, from what I know about Evertonians, losing games. Everton fans can accept. It's the way you lose them. Yeah. And losing to Wolves at home the way they did, losing to Southampton at home the way they did, uh, and stuff like that. Getting beat by Bournemouth twice down there in the way it, you know, the way it happened in the cup and in the league, the fight. That's what. That's the frustrating thing for the fan base. And I and I get it. Players ain't gonna like what the fans are saying. Fans don't like what they saw on the pitch. You're always going to get some some angst. But ultimately, it was the results or lack of the results that cost Frank Lampard in the end. And, you know, again, for all the, the, the problems internally, a decision had to be made on a new manager. And let's be honest here, they could have got this very wrong. <laughs> yeah, I was breaking it. I was breaking it. I, yeah. I was- Thinking now, now I will never speak for any other fan, but I didn't know Bielsa Dice. I never knew the right answer, and I thought it was such a, a divi- you've got such one extreme to another. And I, I'm looking at Bielsa and I'm thinking, maybe we do need that. Maybe we do need someone to take us up the park and, and play attractive football and try and outscore the opposition. Maybe that's what we need. Then I was looking at Sean Dyche going, actually, maybe this team needs to be able to do a lot more the other end of the pitch and, and nick games 1-0. I didn't know. I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. I think the point where I started getting really worried was the Southampton game. Um, if, if you recall, there was a sections of the fan base and, and not all of the fan base but a section of the fan base on a sit-in protest after the game i think sky sports news uh, a soccer saturday when it when full-time hit at goodison park they showed the anger of the crowd towards the players i was there it was toxic 
what's it like for you? Now, now I, I know boyhood Arsenal, and I know Arsenal so close to your heart, but I will, cons- I do consider you an Evertonian. I really mm. do. So, what's it like, not only as an Evertonian, but as a former captain of the football club, to turn on Sky Sports and see those scenes? Well, a lot of the time, Ian, if I'm honest with you, I was commentating on it or I was covering the game. Hmm. So, to s- look, you want harmony. You you want you want everybody to be on the same page, <clears throat> win, lose or draw. But to see the dissension, uh, to see what was going on at the football club, and, and listen, I'm, I'm the first to say, it, Ian, I don't. I think some poor decisions have been made by the board. I've yeah. said it. I've said it on Sky. I've said it on radio. I've said <laughs> I've it heard here. You. I'll say it here. I truly believe some really poor decisions have been made. Everton have spent, you know, five, six hundred million quid, and they're worse. They're in a worse yeah. position. So obviously, that's that's there's some bad decisions that have been made, and you could argue who should be on the board to who shouldn't, and all that. But ultimately, Ian, what it comes down to is results on the pitch. <laughs> Mm. And what I was seeing on the pitch wasn't good. And yeah. the frustration, I was frustrated. So how all the Evertonians in the stadium were and must have been feeling because they've been for it too many times. Sometimes you've got to draw a line in the sand and say, hold on, this is too much. And and, and obviously that's where the vent, the anger gets vented at the board, etc. Listen, I get it. And a lot of ex-players get it because... We've been there on the pitch. We've, you know, we've we've heard when the fans ain't happy, and we've heard when the fans are happy. You've got to take both and and, and keep that balance. But there was just such an imbalance at the football club, and it, it wasn't nice to see. No, and and look, I, I I feel it almost every time I turn my phone on and I, and, I, and I type Everton in Google. It's terrifying because it's almost like a bit of a prank. It's 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 like it's like at times one of my red mates. Is, is sending April Fool's jokes because you go from, you know, where we are with the money and the directors of football, the amount of managers that that we have, it doesn't work out. It's quite embarrassing when you look back at it. You then go into the Southampton game where, again, I, I'm, I'm not going to say what's right or wrong here, and I don't expect you to, but a statement comes out saying that the, the chief executive has been headlocked and the board can't attend the game. That's embarrassing as an Evertonian to have a conversation with another fan about. And now you get into... Everton have potentially breached FFP, and I'm worried about w- what comes next. It just seems like a never-ending cycle. It's it's gone. It's past borderline scary now. It's scary, and again, what I'm, what I'm trying to get as, despite your opinion, and I, I don't expect you to give me your, your full opinion because I understand your work in the in the media and you're an ex-captain of the football club. But do you understand that the 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 altogether now motion at the moment, and a lot of fans think it's time for change. Do you get that? One hundred percent. And and Ian, whether you like that opinion or not, I'm going to give it because Good. at the end of the day, I am I'm, I'm an ex captain of the football club, and you know I, I do have a lot of love for Everton Football Club. And listen, there's there's things that are going on that, as a fan, you're going to question. Yeah. You, you if if. You'd be crazy not to question what's going on. Yeah. You know, especially when the owner comes out and, and says certain things out in the press. And then it comes, it's, that, that's not true. Yeah. It, it's not the case. So as a fan, you're thinking, what's happening at my football club? Yeah. What's going on? And, and you're right to think that. So, again, I look at what, two things. What's, what's to be done? Obviously, new manager came in, had to be done. And there needed to be funds made available to the new manager to help make a difference. One of two things happened. And let's be honest, Sean Dyche was, was announced. We knew he was the manager and he got announced. He got announced in the, in the evening. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, Ian. It, this... Stuff what's going on shouldn't happen. And as for the headlock, listen, I don't know what went on. It, it, it turns out fans were saying it never happened. There's been no, there's been nothing since. Yeah, that's the worry, yeah. 
you know, nobody's been charged. Nobody's been said, yeah, I, I done it. it. It was a joke or, you know, it was misinterpretation. Nothing's come out. So, again, this, this is just driving even more wedges between the board and the fan base. Sean Dyche comes into, is coming to this with, with his backroom staff. And he's got to try and get the players on, on side. Ian, it's a big job. It really is a big job to try and get Everton back on the front foot. But I tell you what, Sean Dyche has, has put Everton on the front foot. But what he's also done, I think he's got the fan base believing again a little bit. I'm not saying they're all going to believe straight away. Yeah. But I'm telling you now, going back to <clears throat> basics ain't a bad thing. Because no. I know what the Evertonians like. The Evertonians like a team who are committed. And yeah. under Sean Dyche, <laughs> this team are committed. They run, they tackle, they get stuck in. And we've even seen more than one goal lately. So, you know, they are playing for the manager. So, again, we know what's happening upstairs. We, we can't put our finger on it all, though. I get the movement. Yeah. Not happy. Going to shout them out. 100%. Of course, when things ain't going well, that's going to happen. But I think a little bit of that has been ta taken down a notch by Sean Dyche and the playing staff getting results. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think the manager couldn't agree more because there's a couple of press conferences that he's done and he's actually thanked the, 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 the All Together Now campaign for, for not bringing that into the football stadium, yeah. for actually getting behind the team. And he's came out and he's, without quoting them directly, along the lines of, you know, thank you for not bringing that in. Thank you for getting behind the team. And I think, and I'm not sure whether you, you were watching this game or commentating it, but we played Villa at home and we got beat 2-0. And, and the big thing for me, Kev, was they got, Evan got clapped off by the fans yeah. that day because it, it, it probably hurts to say this, but Aston Villa are the better football team than Everton. And I think a lot of fans at that day realised that we're not going to win every game. We're not good enough to win every yeah. game. The, the Arsenal game was probably the exception. You're not probably going to yeah. get another one of those but if we can beat the teams around us, where we beat Leeds, we, we stopped Nottingham Forest taking three points at home. Now, I yeah. think that was big. I think Forest probably looked at Everton and thought, we'll beat Everton. I think it we'll was beat big Everton to not... at home. Yeah, you have... yeah, it's the home games that count. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think what you're saying about, about the way the team are working and working for the manager, I think that's spot on. Now, you've been in the dressing room um, where, where Everton have changed managers. What... Now, I don't mean disrespect to any other manager, or, or but what changes in a dressing room? Why does it seem on the outside that players are working harder for a different manager? Is it that simple? Uh, I, no, I, I don't think it is. I think when the new manager comes in, everyone's on a clean slate. Mm. Everyone is. And we've seen Decore, who wasn't even getting a game, yeah, uh, on the Lampard in the end all of a sudden come into the team and he's looking great. Yeah. Scoring goals, he's looking like that midfielder Everton signed from Watford who can get up and down the pitch, put his foot in. He's an all-rounder, isn't he? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, and done really well. So I just think there's, people talk, call it a bounce or, you know, a lift or whatever. I just think at, from a player player's point of view, in the dressing room, everyone's on a clean <laughs> slate and everyone's got to prove themselves again because the new manager doesn't know you in a sense. So he's got to understand who you are. He may know you've played against you or whatever, but actually working with you, etc. everybody's on edge. And being a player on edge is a good thing. Yeah, and, and I suppose as, as well, going back to Decor, right? Maybe some players just need that fresh start. Maybe some players are just going through the motions at, at, at trading Monday to Friday, and they maybe know they're on the bench or they know they're out of favour. And all of a sudden, this new guy comes in and you score one goal. And this guy plays you again the following week. I think that's what we're seeing with Zakora. Um What I would absolutely love is you to be 27, 28 again and coming in on deadline day and putting the cape on. It's unfortunately not going to happen. I think Dominic Calvert-Lewin, uh, I think it's it's plain to see that there's, there's issues injury-wise there, fitness-wise. I don't know whether we can get him back for the length of time that we probably need him to play and score goals. Damari Gray's plays up front, and I think Damari Gray's been very selfless whilst not scoring the goals that we probably need. Ella Sims came on at, at Stanford Bridge, and, and, and I'm, I, I don't think it's right for, for us to say Ella Sims is, is the answer, but how important could that be that Everton now have a young striker who showed he could score a goal going into this running? 
I, I think Ellis Sims is is the key, if I'm mm. honest with you. And I don't want mean to put pressure on him, but I think whether it's coming off the bench, whether starting certain games, I think because of his size and the way he plays, he likes to play on the shoulder. He likes yeah. to run in behind. Dominic Calvert-Lewin likes to do that, but Dominic Calvert-Lewin's more of an all-rounder. I think you, if you play to Domin if you play to Ellis Sims' strength, you saw the ball from Decore, early ball to him straight away. And, you know, look, let's be honest, that Chelsea defence are no mugs. Yeah. And, and the way he went through, you know, he just brushed... People aside, Cooler Bally, Cooler Bally, he was one of the Koulibaly, best defenders. He was yeah. one of the best defenders in the world, yeah. arguably, at, at one stage. Yeah. He just breezed by him and he coolly slotted it um, uh, past, past the Chelsea keeper. That that tells you everything. Obviously, he's, he's waited his time, played at Anfield, but I don't think he got enough support at Anfield because when Liverpool are attacking, you tend to find the team sit too deep, couldn't yeah. get enough bodies around him. Ellie Sims, I believe, is, is, is going to be a key for, for Everton this season because when teams get tired, you can bring him on with half an hour to go, 25 minutes yeah. to go, and you've got to feed him, but he will stretch the pitch and he will, as he's shown, he can cause problems. So, you know, what a nice tick in the box for, for Sean Dyche. You know, I, I, I honestly think if there's no Dominic Calvert-Lewin, there might come a time where you have to play him and um, Mopé or him and Damari Gray up top. You could play Gray in behind, just in behind him, and you could play Ellis Sims up top. He's not a back-to-goal merchant. He's yeah. not. He can do it, but he's not a back-to-goal merchant. He'd rather be on the side where he can get early ball. And you've seen, he's quick, he's direct. And you know what, Ian? Most importantly, he's hungry. I yeah. think that's so important. He's, and he's got good size. So I think Sean Dyche will... will We'll use him in the correct way now. Yeah, look, look you, you saying that makes me smile. Right? He's came in at Anfield and, and not scored a goal, and then he's came in in a big game and scored. A goal. It sounds like that story's been written before, Mister Super Kevin yes. Campbell. I think yes. I've heard this before. <laughs> look, there's enough, there's enough games um, to to not really overly panic. I think Everton play four teams around them. We, we play Crystal Palace, we play Leicester, we play Wolves. We play Bournemouth. There's, there's 12 points there for me, Kev. There really is. I think Everton can go and get 12 points. I think we've got a difficult run away from that. I think Spurs, probably the worst time for them to roll a dice from the new manager. Those players will be buoyed to maybe stick it to Conte. I think Manchester United will be tough. Brighton away will be tough. Man City at home, tough. But there's 12 points there for me. And I think if we beat the teams around us, we take maximum points, maybe even take 10 points. I think we'll be okay. How do you see the running going, Kev? Do, do you think Everton will be okay? Yeah, I do. I think Everton will be okay. I think Everton have got the fundamentals right, Ian. The fundamentals are key. You've got to be able to defend well. And, and you know what? I want to. I want to. I want to say big up to Michael Keane. Michael Keane's coming. And before Michael Keane, I was just I was just waiting for a mistake to be made, Ian. If I'm honest, <laughs> because he just wasn't confident enough. Obviously, yeah. he's worked with Sean Dyche before. You know, him and Tarkovsky, they've played together. They know the system that Sean Dyche wants to play. And he's really virtually been flawless at centre-half. And, uh, you know, Conor Cody has to, has to take a back seat. So, yeah, sometimes these things happen and these things work out. You know, I, I just... For me, I just think the home form is going to be the key. The 12th man's the key. They might have to win one game away from home, Ian. They might have to win one game away from home because I know the away form hasn't been great. But against Forest, where probably Everton could have won the game, but yeah. you know, Forest, Forest are decent at home and they've beaten some good sides at home. Yeah. So to come away with a point, 2 2, I thought was a really good result. But they might just have to win one game away from home. Um, don't care who it's against as long as they get it done. But again, it's going to be Goodison. The fan base at Goodison have to play their part, and I think Everton are going to be okay. Yeah, no, that's it's reassuring to hear somebody who's been at the at the fighting line, the front line, doing it for us to say that. Um, Kev, it's been an absolute pleasure. You probably noticed me smiling throughout this podcast. You you are actually one of my favourite players, and I don't want to make you feel old, but I was growing up as a as a worried teenager when Liverpool were 
were doing what they were doing, and Everton weren't too good. And you came in and sort of give us give us someone to say, well, we've got Kev- we've got Kevin Campbell, and, and yeah. that was fantastic. Yeah. I've earned all these years, mate, so don't worry about. It. <laughs> <laughs> I've earned them, believe me, I've earned them. So I'm, I'm blessed enough to have no pain in my body. I'm all right. Um, I'm blessed enough to be able to to come on and speak to you, Ian, about about such a fantastic football club like Everton. I just wish I just wish and hope everybody could slowly come back together. Obviously, with with a few more wins, I think um, I think there will be changes uh, at board level at some stage. Um, I know the fans want it ASAP, but I think it's going to take a little bit of time um, because nothing happens very quickly at Everton. Let's be honest. So I think no. it will take a little bit of time, but I think it will be done. I think people realise now what has to happen. It's a perfect way to end the podcast. The, the respect me and my friends who have for you is, is is almost second to none. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope everybody who's watched this and listened to it on the audio podcast has enjoyed it as much as I have. Super Kev Campbell, I wish you were 25 years younger, my man, but it's an absolute honour to speak to you. Thank you for joining us again on Across the Park Podcast. No, you're welcome, Ian. Thank you very much for having me on. And uh, you know what comes next, mate. Up the toffees. All the best. Oh. Toffees. <laughs> <laughs>